Greetings, fellow investigators, and welcome to our video podcast, Into the Darkness, where my friends and I play the Call of Duty role-playing game. I'm your host, Tom Rayleigh. We're about to begin a campaign consisting of seven chapters. It's from the Cthulhu Britannica series, and it's entitled The Curse of Nineveh. It was written by Mike Mason, Mark Latham, Scott Dorward, and Paul Fricker, and it's available from the Chaosium website. Let's introduce our players. Uh, Jason, why don't you go first? Hello, I'm Jason Molnichok, and today I'll be playing Cyrus Finley. He's from the good old United States, down south, Alabama. His, his family's in the tobacco industry. Uh, he didn't really want to step foot into his father's, you know, following his father's footsteps. So he took off to Africa and went on some expeditions, became an explorer. He found himself in London, and now he's looking for some finance money to fund his next expedition. Thank you. Tim? Oh, me? <laughs> Why, of course. It's been so nice getting to know you. My name is Ebenezer Flint, and I'm a retired conservative member of parliament under Herbert Henry Asquith. Despite his wishy-washy liberal politics, we were close, and he gifted me this here cane. I absolutely adore this ibis head top made of brass atop this gorgeous date wood shaft. Oh, I think of it fondly. Originally from Whitechapel, I was raised in the Church of England, but have become increasingly fascinated by the antiquities of ancient Egypt, always dreaming of embarking on an expeditionary team to the sandy tombs. For now, however, I spend my time with my dear daughter, who manages my many philanthropic trusts and finances. I cling to her dearly after the death of my wife, Eloise. God rest her soul. Jerry? I am Fuller Albright. I... I am a bit of a bookworm. I collect rare books, books on the occult, other specialty books. And I have a little shop down on the East End where I peddle my wares. Cool. Mick? Uh, good, good, uh, good evening. Um, my, my name is uh, Angus Fitzroy. And... Um, well, I, 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 um, I, I sort of, uh, I, I potter about a bit. Um, I, I, I'm rather, rather interested in, 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 in esoteric matters, but um, I, I, along, along with my manservant, I've been uh, in, investigating a number of uh, uh, things of that nature, but um, with one uh, rather noticeable exception, they've, uh, they've all proved to be uh, nothing but uh, flim-flam merchants, I'm afraid. But um, unfortunately, my, uh, my, my apartments are under renovation at the moment, and my, uh, my manservant is uh, visiting family down in the West Country, so I'm, uh, I'm staying here, up here at my club. Hmm. David? Uh, I'm Reginald Harcourt. Uh, having served in Palestine during the Great War, I developed an interest in the Near East, uh, being a widower, and uh, with no children, I have ample time to uh, employ my allowance in investigations of various sorts. I've been on a couple of digs and greatly look forward to uh, further investigations of that fascinating part of the world. Excellent. Ford? Hi, I'm Ford. I'm going to be playing Vadim Gamatov. Uh, Vadim is. Uh, sort of a self-styled uh, Russian prince, uh, as they say in this day and age. Although truthfully, he's more of a baronet. Uh, he is disposed from the uh, unfortunate happenings in Russia. Um, unlike many in the uh, Russian aristocracy or aristocracy in general, he conducts himself more like a, a young academic or shall we say a professor. Um, his uh, interests are in uh, mathematics and cryptography and uh, physics. Uh, but there's rumors to the effect that he may be uh, investigating things of more of an esoteric nature here and there. Um, something about connections with the Golden Dawn and other organizations here in London. But uh, as everybody seems to see it, he seems to be more of a, you know, you know more, more of a level-headed guy who doesn't really seem to uh, go for all this uh, occult business. But then again, 
people speak otherwise. All right, this is gonna be fun. Let's begin our journey into the darkness. <clears throat> Located in the heart of London, the Wentworth Club occupies an imposing three-story neoclassical building surrounded by a wrought iron fence. Beyond the imposing black wooden doors are a range of rooms in which members can find solace from the hectic hustle and bustle of London life. At present, there are nearly 150 members of this gentleman's club, but in a break with tradition, some of them are in fact women. Membership is exclusive, and one must be invited to buy a member to, in order to join. Most of the members are fairly wealthy, though this is not an absolute requirement. The most prevalent commonality among its members is an interest in the esoteric and the occult, and this is the subject of most of their conversations. <clears throat> it is the evening of July 9th, 1925, a Thursday. You have been invited to a memorial dinner in honor of a recently departed member, Lord Howard Brightman. Though you didn't know him personally, it's good form to show up for these sorts of gatherings in support of those who have known him. Through the evening, things uh, seem rather somber in the beginning, but after a while, uh, cocktails are circulated and people begin to socialize. Um, at, a, at a set time, the club president, Gregory Bluffstone, calls for silence. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ladies, gentlemen, and honored guests, I welcome you to the Wentworth Club. I'm afraid the welcome comes at the blackest of times. Our friend and colleague, Lord Brightman, is no more. Taken from us by wicked fate in a most heinous of crimes, it is with a heavy heart that tonight's proceedings are held in his honor. We come to pay our respects and to remember him. Now, I have known Lord Brightman for a number of years and was one amongst many who greatly enjoyed listening to his tales of adventure brought back from his travels and archaeological digs. Indeed, I, I remember once he terrified us with uh, a tale of his exploits while in Nineveh. Uh, you, Theodore, you remember that night. Uh, I'm not going to go into that story now, but uh, suffice it to say that Lord Brightman was taken from us much too early, and we mourn his passing. Let tonight's dinner stand in memoriam to him. Let us of the Wentworth Club honor our dead. I give you, my friends, Lord Howard Brightman. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. 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 <laughs> Bully. So, you guys are in the Wentworth Club, meandering around. What would you like to do? I mean, you're doing it. <clears throat> um, there are there are a lot of people there. Well, I, I will. Um, I'll find someone to talk to. A friend of yours? Yes, yes. Oh, look, there's Bunty over there. I say Bunty. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, what, what, oh what, what, I guess. What's all this? What's all this business about? Um, the, 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 bit, the old bit there um, it said something about it being under under unpleasant circumstances. It was the old fella bumped off? Oh, you didn't hear, did you? No. Ah, oh, he was broken into. Broken into his house. Somebody murdered him. In his own house? Yes, yes. I, I think that his uh, his manservant found him in the morning. And, uh, 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 I mean, we don't know all of the details. The police have been quite uh, you know, quiet about certain things. Uh, that's the way the police are. But tough bit of luck there. He was a nice old boy. Good. Didn't have to be murdered, certainly. <coughs> Michael, do, do they have anyone... Um, uh, in, in the frame, as, as, they, as they say. Oh, none that I know of. Probably some vagabond coming in looking for something. How ghastly. That's ghastly, too. In fact, it's, it's, uh, I heard rumors 
that whatever it was, they did things to his body, unspeakable, horrible things. But don't say you heard it from me. No, no, fine. Good Lord. Might this conversation be happening near a particularly nice Hungarian brandy? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It's uh, hand uh, to hand to the food, brandy. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I don't uh, mean to intrude. Uh, Reginald Harcourt uh, is my name. I didn't know the old gentleman. You say he was murdered in his own home? Yes, yes. Yes, it was in the newspapers. You didn't see. I don't always read the uh, more sensational items. Well, I mean, that's all that I know about it, but you know. <sighs> have you ever been to his home? No, I don't think I have. Well, Theodore's been there. I think Bluffstone himself was a friend. Uh, but uh, uh, no, no, never went there. I saw him here at the club once in a while. We'd sit near the fire and he'd talk. He talk and talk and talk, you know. Well, no, never spoke. Saw, saw him around. Never spoke to him myself. Oh, well, that's he, a shame. He's a nice man. Well, well, Does well, he leave well, a wife behind? Oh, sorry. oh no, I don't think he's been married for years. I think it's actually yes. I do remember. I think that his wife died just just a year ago or so. Hmm. So a great man. Cut down in his own home. It's a shocking state of affairs. Well, you know, he's a, a, he'd become a bit of a recluse after she died. And, mm. and uh, yes, I don't think we've seen him at the club for, for quite a while. Do we know who inherits? No idea. Someone's got some good news coming, I suppose. Is anybody else talking to friends? Yeah, I, I would see uh, Mr. Deckhart, Wallace Deckhart. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I was how you getting along. Uh, part of my manners, I didn't rightly know Mr. Uh, Howard Bradman all that well or nothing, but um, do, you oh. know, uh, do you know where he, his residence is? Do you know where, was he in London? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, his residence wasn't too far from here. Uh uh, a bit, a bit horrible about uh, the break-in. Uh, there was a break-in. Um, that that's that's how he met his demise, I, I guess. Right? Like, I heard he was murdered. Yes, from what I understand, uh, somebody slit his throat ear to ear. Did did they uh, uh, did they take his, his belongings? Was it like financial or was it personal? Did he owe some money? No, oh, I don't doubt seriously that he owed any money. The man had plenty of money. That's just one of those things, you know. I'm sure that the, uh, I'm sure the police have those sorts of details, or they're looking into them. Maybe uh, he had a a, a, mis a mistress, and she she had, she had a beau. Oh, <laughs> I, if he had a mistress at his age, yes, I doubt that. But you know, he's been kind of recluse for the last year. He hasn't come out much. Uh, no, never since never since he got back from Iraq, uh, had a had a bit of a hard time there. I think uh, working on that uh, that uh, Rayburn Price, no, the um, the Campbell expedition. You know, uh, what what was that Campbell expedition? Oh, you know, the Campbell expedition. They went to Nineveh back in uh, '09, and uh, you know, he he. I think he once said to me that there were. Quite a lot of mishaps that took place on that, uh, on that, uh, that, that dig. Never was quite the same when he came back. Were Were any of the other uh, club members uh, on that expedition? Oh yeah. Um, let's see who else was on it. Well, King, of course, died. Uh, died a few years ago. Uh, and uh, let's see. Um, you know, I'm sure there were other people on that. I'm sure there were members here. Um, well, Brightman himself was one of them, yes. And, uh, and there's that chap. I can never remember his name. He ended up in the, in the loony bin. 
my lord. Yes, it's, it's, it reminds one of that uh, that Carter expedition to Egypt uh, and all the mishaps that that occurred after that. Said 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 it was cursed. Perhaps some, it was. Some rightly strange things coming out of the heart of Africa these days. Well, thank you, thank you. Anyway, a bell rings about that time, and the uh, butler in charge, whose last name is, everybody calls him Sykes, uh, he comes out and says, gentlemen, the dinner is served. Please, join us in the dining room. Oh, jolly good. Wee vittles. Well, shall we? So, I any of you coming into another bag? Do we know anything at all about the deceased? Is what kind of job he did? What kind of things he was into? Not really. Okay. So um, you are all ushered into the dining room. There's tables that uh, uh, that seat a few pe- that seat people. Uh, you look at the schedule the, at the list, and you are all set at, seated at the same table. Um, but after a few minutes of people milling about and taking their places, uh, a gentleman comes up to you, and uh, he's like, "Pardon me, gentlemen, um, uh, I don't seem to have a place to sit. Would you mind if I shared your table with you?" By all means, please pull up a chair. Oh, thank you. That is very kind of you. Uh, Yes, it's not, not very well, not very well uh, thought out if they've, they've left us, some of us out of the thing. Uh, Theodore, Theodore Rayburn Price, and he shakes all of your hands. And so you do notice, pleasure. You do, I'm sorry, you do notice that this is the guy that Bluffstone was referencing when he said that they had shared a, a, a friendship with Brightman. Uh, he says, oh, he says dinner is supposed to be very, very good tonight. Uh, tremendously sorry for your loss, sir. Oh, my friendship with, uh, with Brightman, yes. Yes, he was a very fine gentleman, very nice man, very easy to uh, talk to, love to tell stories. What was one of your favorite stories? No. Oh. Well, you know, he traveled a lot, traveled in Africa, traveled in uh, the Middle East, um, told me about climbing the pyramids once. That, that sounded fascinating. Wow. That is quite fascinating. Yes. When did he do that? Oh, you know? I don't know. years ago, five, five, ten years ago. Have you ever gone with him? <laughs> no, not actually. I, I once thought in my youth, I entertained the idea that maybe I would be an archaeologist, and uh, I, 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 I traveled at one point uh, to uh, a small little place in, uh, in, in Iran, and uh, I found the temperature uh, stiflingly hot, and the, and the dust, and the dirt, and everything, and I, I hightailed it right back to London, and I decided that no, I like the rain and I like the fog, and I'm not really that interested in the, the dirt and the digging. But I still have a fascination. I have some fascination with uh, history and with antiquities and things like that. And no, now I, I usually, I, 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 I have an inheritance, you see, and I, make, I have enough money that I can just spend my time entertaining my interests. Uh, uh, sometimes friends will ask me to broker a deal, you know, on something, a sale or, or an auction or something like that. And I, I do whatever. If, if, it, if it interests me, then I, I do it. Well, at least he has had the opportunity now to reunite with his dear wife, two yeah. friends, and reuniting with old loved ones. Yes, that was, she was killed in a carriage accident. Her and her, uh, her and his daughter. Were both killed. Oh, terrible accident. Had not heard of his daughter. Yes, he uh, he thought that he was cursed. It certainly can be a burden to lose a child or a wife. Uh, it can leave a man changed. I think. Yes, I think so. Uh, Bluffstone mentioned some uh, famous yarn of his uh, about Nineveh. Ah, yes. 
Do you know that tale? Yes. Bluffstone and I, we'd gone over to uh, to Brightman's house, and uh, he wanted to show us some of the antiquities that he had picked up along the way. He was a very nice man, you understand, very kind. Uh, whenever he would go on one of these things, he'd always bring me some trinket or something from foreign lands. Very nice. Uh, but he wanted to show us some of the things that he had discovered uh, while he was in Nineveh. And uh, we spent an enjoyable evening drinking and, uh, and looking over his collection. And then he, he got kind of very serious and he wanted to show us one final piece. And it was a, a very odd thing, an odd thing indeed. It was a little statue we deduced that it was the god Nabu, uh, the god of uh, knowledge, wisdom, the god of scribes, the god of writing. Uh, only somehow the statue itself was very odd. It, it had that sort of primitiveness to it, not quite of the same caliber as some of the later Assyrian sculptures. And, it, it gave us all a rather odd feeling. And that's probably because of the story that he told us on how he had acquired it. He said that he had been working in Iraq uh, near, uh, uh, near the, the, the ruins of Nineveh. And uh, he had gotten up one night because he couldn't sleep. And as he was wandering about, uh, he ran across a thief who was attempting to steal that very statue. And uh, he confronted him, and as he put it, he was afraid that he was going to have his throat cut. So he shot the, uh, the thief. Uh, didn't kill him outright, but left him bleeding there. And uh, he went up to the thief, and the thief took the statue and put it into his hands and said, fine, you take it. Take it along with the curse that goes with it. That is most odd. And now the poor man's had his throat cut. I, I, think, that, I think that Brightman, whether or not the curse was real, I think Brightman believed it. I think he believed that he'd been cursed because everything seemed to go downhill from there. He came back. He, he wasn't the same person anymore. Very morose. Began to become very secluded. And of course, then his wife died. Yes, but we know everything over there is cursed from the beginning. Yes, right, right. Yes, every, every, everybody talks about curses. It's mostly sensationalism, but you know, quite honestly, I'm not so sure that I don't believe that it's true. I've lost my friend. He's lost his wife and child. Bit of bad luck, really. Pardon me. Who's in possession of the statue now? Oh, I have no idea. That's um, troubling. Probably still in his collection. Do you know, um, by any chance, uh, about any bequests? Does he leave in pieces he gathered to a museum? Or? Oh, I have no idea. Probably, probably that will be handled by lawyers, and uh, mm. I have no idea, really. Uh, but you have seen the statue. You too found it was... Oh, now this was the end, yes, but uh, I, you know, it it was. I don't know how to explain it. It was just different than was anything it, else. Was it stone or clay or? In this case, yes, it was stone. Uh, what sort? Do you know? I don't really know. A black basalt or? No, no, it was yellow. Hmm. It was sandstone of some sort. Hmm. And you think it's old? I'm sorry? You think it's how old? Oh, you know, I really didn't uh, take, take that long to, uh, to examine it. I don't um, think I know of this. Did you say Nabu or Mabu? Nabu. Nabu. Nabu, the god of, uh, of scribes is how he's usually pronounced. Hmm. Has a very distinctive high priest sort of helmet with horns coming around the front. That sounds like an interesting either seen with his hands like this or like this 
just depending. There's, there's, a large, there's a large statue of him, I believe, at the British Museum. Definitely there is. Though I find it interesting that um, a god of scribes would be doing a lot of uh, cursing. Or there'd be curses. At, at well, I think, now the rumor is, is that, uh, that Campbell and King went to Nineveh and were uh, complete failures at finding it. Uh, they were looking for something. Uh, this would have probably come out of that dig in 1909. So I'm sure it's still in his collection somewhere. Well, this is quite troubling. I, I, I don't, I guess I don't understand that there seems to be no lead on the product. Uh, surely the, the boys at Scotland Yard are more adept than that. It's it's only recent. I don't know. I don't go to the police and ask them such questions. But I'm sure they're working on it. Would you by chance know the lawyer that is handling the estate? Hmm. I could find that information for you at some point and give it to you. I would be most thankful. Harder than I, me for intruding there, but um, has there been anything missing uh, in regards to his death? Um, I have no idea. Hmm. I don't know much more than what I've already told you. Okay. Hmm. Uh, the, I think that I heard that the detective was named Marcus Brinslow of Scotland. Sounds familiar. I think I've met him before. Yes. We've seen him around once in a while. Uh, can you just say that name one more time? Marcus Brinslow. Brinslow. I think my brother knows him. And all the while you guys are talking, you're eating, and, and everything at dinner has, has progressed. It's uh, Eb Ebenezer, um, I need to... What are all these forks for? Because I'm not really all that familiar with 14 forks on my plate for dinner. Just, um, well, start start from the outside and work your way in, old boy. We both kind of help side by side getting him from no, the no, sides. No, not, not that one. That's a, that's <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't use yeah, that. Yeah. Let, me, let me remind the players that you didn't join the Wentworth Club today. <laughs> Tyrus, be lucky. At least in Russia, we, we, we have 20 forks and 30 spoons. So, you in know, Russia, this is, this is easy. Is you. That's right. He's, he's sitting at the table as he's eating. You see paws periodically uh, rubbing the ibis head of his staff. He appears to be very deep in thought somewhere. So anyways, dinner finishes. People have dessert. People drink some. And, and then they, they get up and they start to mill around. Um, uh, uh, Rayburn Price gets up and you know, says, a, a pleasure to meet you all. And, uh, and of course, uh, we can also say that you pretty much gave him your story so that he knows who you are now. Um, and he wanders off. Listen, uh, gentlemen, I, this all seems so murky. I wish I knew more about what was happening. Perhaps some of those dreadful journalists might have some information on it or the police, but it feels so strange, such a great collection just hanging out there after a break-in, and with the similarities between the way they died and the, the curse, uh, curiouser and curiouser. Well, I'm wondering if when they read the will, if some of the items will be left to uh, the club, maybe maybe then we could oh, get yes. our hands, you know, to, to investigate some of the items. I prefer a more direct route. Uh, I'm not so much worried about the uh, curses or anything, but uh, if our fellow member there left a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, priceless antiquities, uh, I would seriously think we should look into maybe making sure that they go to the proper authorities and people who can actually handle them well. Well, gentlemen, I have a proposal for all of you. We're all friends, of course, and we've been here for some time. Uh, we can sit in these halls all day and do nothing. 
Well, we could look into this ourselves. It seems like quite the mystery. Is anyone here up for a, a bit of an expedition? If you will? I'm, I'm always up for an expedition. I mean, I've been to Africa already, Egypt, in fact. But I'm always looking for an adventure. There's an adventure over every hill. Now, there are still other people. There's lots of people. You can still talk to people. Where, 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 where is it that, um, that this, this, uh, his lordship uh, lived? Give me a moment. <laughs> because, I, I mean, obviously, you know, it... Uh, Let's just say he gives you the address. Go ahead for it. Oh. <clears throat> well, I was expecting something a little more salubrious than that. I'm just saying that you discovered the, uh, the address. It's not that hard to find. Um, you know, yes, well, I'm, told, I'm told it's an up-and-coming area. I've heard good things about it. Um, you know, gentlemen, I'm going to, uh, uh, being a bit caught off guard here with one of our own fellowship cut down yeah. like this, I'm going to uh, pop up to the library and look at the papers from a few days ago and see what I can about the gentlemen and the circumstances, which seem most unusual. Well, be like before, now, now we'll say like you've been chatting, you've been talking to each other for about an hour. Um, You've you've moved around a bit. Maybe you're you're smoking cigars in, in one of the lounges, and, and you're you're intending to go up and into the library. Um, about that time, uh, Theodore Rayburn Price, uh, you see him come into the room, and he's looking around, and and he suddenly sees you, and he's like, ah, like this, and he comes back over to where you are, and he says, "Oh, my friends." I have been looking for you. I could really use your assistance. Would you have a moment to spare? Sure. Of Absolutely, course. Theodore. It's been many, many weeks since I've seen you. No, it's... You, there was a dinner. Oh, it's just a dinner. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's go upstairs uh, to one of the private lounge, lounges and we can talk. Of course. Sounds most intriguing. So he takes you upstairs. Any weeks since the dinner to the top floor uh, and uh, he takes you into one of the private rooms where there's a fireplace and, and a lamp and, and a couple of chairs and there is a woman sitting in one of the chairs. Uh, she looks like she's about 23. Uh, she has black hair and a little uh, 1920s uh, bob cut. Um, she's very smartly dressed and she's sitting there and he says to you all, he says, please come inside. Uh, this is Miss Needy Selsebuck. Uh, we want to, uh, we want to, uh, discuss something with you. Uh, I'm sorry to drag you away from the hubbub, but I think that you may, be, may be able to help us. Uh, now we mentioned earlier, Reginald Campbell Thompson, uh, uh, he was with Leonard King at the dig at Kyunji, Nineveh, back in 1903. Mm. Uh, well, they were trying to find the temple of Nabu, a lost repository of artifacts where the king's ransom. If you can recall the papers at the time, it was reported that the pair were unlucky and unable to locate the temple, so they returned to London. But rumors have persisted ever since that, that the pair planned and executed later a secret dig at Kyunjik. Now, in 1919, Leonard King became unwell and he died suddenly in his hotel room. Lord Brightman told me that he and Thompson, as well as a small number of others, departed England following Leonard's death to further explore Nineveh. According to what Brightman told me, it wasn't long before some of the dig uh, began to have accidents, as I mentioned, the supposed curse. Uh, and suddenly the woman chimes up and she says, 
that's when I come into the picture. Uh, I recently returned to London to recuperate after a difficult time in Scotland. I thought it would do me some good to catch up with some old friends, so I stayed at my pal Bingo and Honorius. Uh, I also met up with a good friend, Archie Glossop, who works at the British Museum. Uh, one of the men, a uh, 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 great conversationalist, but he told me that staff at the museum were currently cataloging hundreds of artifacts from a dig at Nineveh. What was strange was that the last dig there had been was back in 1903, and all the items from that dig had already been cataloged some time ago. It seemed like there had been a more recent, perhaps secret, dig at Nineveh. He had heard rumors that Thompson had actually gone back to Nineveh and uncovered something truly terrific, and that the artifacts were actually from there. So Archie, and she suddenly looks very sad. Archie also said that there had been a number of recent thefts among the finds he'd been working on. As we were old chums, he gave me a list of the objects that were believed to have been stolen. And also, he lent me one of the new artifacts, which he smuggled out of the museum so that I might be able to look into it and see if I could determine where it had come from. Uh, you see, I... I do some archaeology. In my time, I had come to know a man named Karl Schweinsauger, who deals in antiquities. So I went to his shop. When I mentioned the thefts at the museum, he told me that he thought that they were items from Kunjik, from the Mount of Nebu Yunis. When I showed him the artifact that Archie had lent me, he initially dismissed it as from the mound of Nebu Yunus. But then he took a closer look at the mark on the base, and I swear to you, he turned pale as a ghost and muttered something about Nabu and uh, that bastard king. He was, he was uh, scared, visibly scared, and he shooed me out of the shop. What's worse, as I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. So I went back to the British Museum to see Archie again, only to find the antiquities section cordoned off with, and swarming with police. There was blood and a body in the Assyrian section. Some of the, uh, after some fruitless inquiries, I managed to speak to Thompson himself, and he told me that Archie was dead, that he'd been murdered right there in the British Museum, and, and why he asked me why I was at the museum. Well, I made some sort of an excuse, and I left in a hurry. I was angry, and I was filled with grief, and I went straight back to, Ever to, uh, to Carl's shop to get to the bottom of things. Carl played dumb, refusing to answer my questions. I don't know what came over me, but I saw red. I slapped his face and I pushed his fingers into the desk drawer, trapping them. That made him tell me the truth. He said that Leonard King and Thompson had found something in Nineveh and brought something back that should never have, that should have been left behind. He also mentioned a curse. Words poured from his head, strange words, ancient names that filled me with dread. I, I can't recall them exactly, but uh, they were dark indeed. He said I must leave and tell no one. As I turned away, though, he tried to grab me. Before I knew it, I had reached for a whiskey bottle on his desk and smashed it over his head, running from the shop as quickly as I could. Ever since then, I've been followed. I believe someone is after me because I've been asking too many questions. Theo here tells me that he has confidence that you people are good people willing to aid a lady in distress. Please help me. I fear that more people are going to die. My dear, my dear, just relax. There's no need for hysterics. We're happy to help you. Uh, it would be our pleasure to help you with whatever you need. So, so Theodore says, so my friends, 
we're asking for your help. Both Nevi and I are, quite frankly, too well known to go snooping around the British Museum, you see. Uh, everyone there knows us. We need people like you who aren't involved, able to talk to people like uh, uh, Carl and at his shop and get more answers. My own experience with Howard Brightman leads me to believe that all is not well. I fear Nevi is in danger, so I've arranged for her to leave the city quietly. Something is afoot. Rumors persist that Thompson found the Temple of Naboo if that's so, then what he brought back from there might explain current events. Uh, at that point, Nevi reaches into her pocketbook and she pulls out something that is wrapped in red velvet. And she's going to hand it to somebody who wants to take it from her. I'll take it from her. Okay. So she hands you something. Uh, you unwrap it. Here is the artifact given to Miss Selzebuck, uh, Theodore says. Uh, it's, it's made out of solid gold. Uh, we only ask that you look after it. I have to say, it bears, in some ways, an uncanny resemblance to the one shown to me by Lord Brightman those years ago. Perhaps you can return it to the British Museum or hold on to it until more has been discerned. Two of our friends are dead already. Can we rely on you to look into Brightman's death as well as poor Mr. Glossop? Find out who or what's behind these murders? Perhaps you can help prevent more deaths. I'll certainly do whatever I can. This piece is uncanny and a little disturbing. Is this usually how he's represented, this Naboo? Archie said that it was unusual. He called it Naboo incarnate. He said that the, uh, the figure on the bottom was dressed like a priest and that he seemed to be transforming into Naboo. Yes, I see that. Quite. Well, gentlemen, what do you think? May I have a look at it? Well, certainly. How, how big is this? Like... It's about eight inches. Okay. I want to. I want to try something, Tom. Um, I, between history, the occult, a praise, I'm trying to get an estimation of what this would have been used in the ceremonies. It's obviously Babylonian, from the looks of it. Um, I don't read the script that that's in, but is there just some kind of historical significance to this thing? Or, I don't know if the Babylonians made stuff out of gold, you know, I mean, on a regular basis. Is this like a different kind of metal than they would normally use? Well, roll your, roll your history. You want history? Okay. Yeah. Oh, six, six. That's not critical, but it was a, I got a 45 and I got a six, so. Well, um. The, the Babylonians had adopted a number of Assyrian gods, and this is one of them, but this is definitely Assyrian. And uh, it's unusual. You've never seen any kind of a depiction of Nabu rising out of a, another person. It's right. highly unusual. You've never seen any god depicted in this manner. As to the, the script on the bottom, you have no idea. It's definitely right, not cuneiform. Well, it's I, not cuneiform. It doesn't even look like cuneiform. Right. That's what that, that, they would have wrote it in as cuneiform. So it's probably, a, I'm guessing here, but could it be like a sigil, a sign? Like, you know, a signet ring? It's nothing, nothing you've ever like seen. Because it's not, they would have wrote in cuneiform, which this is clearly not. So it's not writing in the directest sense, it's like a, a decorative, what do you call those, flourish? It's almost like a Sanskrit. Well, actually, you know what? No, it doesn't look anything like Sanskrit. You, you know, I, you're I, all looking I, at it. You can all roll. I, I did read once that the, the, the priestly casts 
of some cultures had um, secret languages. Mind you, that was in a book about Druids, but, but perhaps, uh, perhaps that might apply to that. This, the, uh, the way that the um, calligraphic looking shape is on the base of the pedestal reminds me of a, a signet ring or uh, you know, a, a wax stamp sort of seal. I don't know if they had wax, but they certainly sealed clay with images on it. I just don't know why this image wouldn't be linguistic in Babylonia. You, you, know, you know, it could be a maker's mark or a, a hallmark or some such. Actually, Tom, I'm going to let you decide if this is meta or not. But I do have history. If it's a Sir if it's a Syrian, they actually had a script that they wrote in, not cuneiform. Uh, it's not that. So, Tom, I rolled a history roll, and I got 19 out of 65, so it's a hard success. I don't know if that will give me any information. None whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tom, and there, I, go ahead. There's nothing Egyptian on this, correct? Because I, I, okay, that's... It's definitely not Egyptian. Right. I have a little Akkadian, and I know this is not Akkadian script. I presume. What god is it? All right, so Nineveh is a god. No, Nineveh is a city. Okay, so what god is this depicting? Nabu. Nabu. All right, sorry, my bad. All right, so this is, we should look up and see what we can find about Nabu. I mean, you know, what were, what was, kind of a god was he? What did he do? What did his followers do? And Theodore, you, you saw the statue of Nabu that Brightman had come back with. Is it similar to this in any way? In a way, the one that I saw was far more twisted. Right, and of stone, not gold. Correct. Um, but the iconography was similar, I take it? Well, there were no wings on what I, uh -huh. what I saw. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I, now that I see this, there was something sort of misshapen at the bottom of the one that I saw previous. I wouldn't have thought that it was a person, though. But it didn't appear to be broken. It seemed intact as a piece. It could stand. Yes, yes. But we, we, had, we didn't have the, the uh, uh, there was no base on the one that I saw. It, it would have been held in the hand. Uh-huh. And so it just, it had a misshapen form at its feet or at its knees? From the waist down, yes. From the waist down. Well, I wonder if they're of the same uh, cultural origin. Um, at this point, he looks over at Nevi and he says, uh, our uh, our transport is ready. We have to go. I'm going to put her and get her get her to a safe place. My dear, do be safe. Should you need to get a hold of us, here's my number, and I'll hand out a calling card for her. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, not, to inter not, not to interject too much. Just to let you know, Tom, I got a hard success with the ten on uh, occult, but I missed my history roll. Yeah, you guys don't recognize any of it. Okay. <laughs> Even if you got an O one, <laughs> we, we don't okay. we don't recognize none of it. I'm just kidding. Ooh. Mm. gentlemen, right. could I offer a, a interesting line of speculation on this uh, this statue here? Um, I now I cannot say that this is the exact case with statue here, but um, I'm thinking that it might also it might depict a uh, sort of uh, enlightenment where uh, one one who learns rises above and perhaps the wings are sort of the uh, embodiment of rising above with enlightenment you know considering this nabu uh, god character as a scribe through learning you become enlightened and you arise well i i i don't know a great deal about um uh, Mesopotamian uh, religion, uh, but but I do know that he was associated with. Um, uh, I think the Greeks 
re regarded him um, as, as being an incarnation of Apollo, but the, the Romans regarded him more as an incarnation of, of uh, Mercury. And, and from, what, from what you say of him being a, um, the god of scribes and scholars, he'd be more akin to uh, Mercury or, uh, or Tehuti. In other in other traditions, but, it's just um, it's it's also quite curious the location of the body that uh, the god is emerging from the individual uh, very from the the back of the spine as he's bent over to touch the feet, creating almost an uh, equilibrium uh, of man arched over uh, uh, extremely painful position to be placed in no doubt. At, at this at some point in here. Uh, uh, Theodore and Nevi have to leave. They leave. They've left you there. Godspeed. Uh, did you see? Uh, Theodore is taking Nevi someplace safe, but he's not going to hiding himself. She's no, he'll be. He'll be back. Right. And we got Carl's information from her. Yes, he he owns a shop uh, called Sweet Relics. Not Sweet Relish. Sweet relics. <laughs> and we haven't heard of him. No. And oh. uh, what's the odds that one of us know a Glossop? I understand it's a very established family. Probably not. Quite a few of them about, I'm told. Well, all I could say is that there are two murders, one at the museum and one of our fellow club member, both loosely connected to this uh, guy, the statue and or items coming from, uh, coming from Iraq. Maybe not so loosely. I'm just, you know, just speculating, but... It would be rather unfortunate if our friend uh, was involved in such uh, deep matters of uh, intrigue. Tom, I sent you a message. Well, it's clear that people are willing to murder for something that came out of Iraq. Whether it's to get it back home or what, or just pure monetary gain, it's still murder. And two people, one we know and one that is a friend of the the club. Well, gentlemen, I, I do hate to interject, but I wanted to let you know, uh, as, as some of you may well know, uh, particularly Reginald, uh, I carry many philanthropic trusts, and many of which are focused at the British Museum, so that could be useful to us in getting information. You could rather. I wish that uh, Mr. Glossop, while he was alive, had been uh, documenting the materials that were going missing more specifically. Do we know he hasn't? We don't, we, Nevi didn't say anything to the effect. Uh, Be curious to, you know, <laughs> it's a little scandalous, I suppose, uh, but to examine his residence, perhaps there's more information there. But didn't the, didn't the lady say that there was cataloging going on of stuff that came out of there? So somebody was cataloging these items. Yes, Glossop was recording them, but I don't know that he recorded what was going missing. Um, yes. But he or perhaps a journal. was recording them. There's only one way to find out. Perhaps he has a journal, and that could be very insightful. I could probably uh, dredge up his address if I were to make a few connections, of course. <laughs> my, my understanding, I mean, didn't they, when they... Jerry, Jerry you, you are you seem to be muted there. No, you're muted. Or it's not working. It's just not showing you it's muted. Good. There you go. Hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Um I I think we need to know more of a baseline of Nineveh, Naboo, and all this. So I'm gonna go to the library. I'm assuming since we are in a cult-based club, our library will be well um, stocked. <laughs> yes. Is, I propose we take a very uh, consolidated approach to this, something that we could organize and uh, approach from a, a sensible manner. 
Uh, obviously, there are many different things we could look into. Uh, the home of, uh, Ms. of Lord Brightman, uh, the uh, situation with the gentleman who was killed at the British Museum, the British Museum itself. Uh, the lawyer has been brought up, uh, perhaps speaking to uh, Officer Brinslow of Scotland Yard, uh, the, which could force our hand quite early, I assume. Uh, obviously, investigating the library and looking into Carl Schwensinger, or whatever his name is, uh, but that could, if that's when she started noticing people following her, that could be something that creates, uh, should be a last resort. What do you all think? What would, where do you best fit in? I believe Fuller said that he'd want to go to the library. Are you all uh, moving to the library? We might as well continue this conversation up in the library, assuming so, that there aren't uh, too be, many. In this case, down in the library, it's on the, it's on the floor below you. I do uh, think uh, the... The museum will hold some definite answers. Well, it depends like how much they're willing to tell us, really, doesn't it? I mean, um, I'm sure I remember reading in the papers somewhere that they didn't find much when the, when the, when the British Museum had a, an expedition there. But didn't that young lady say that there was a bunch of cataloging going on of stuff that just miraculously appeared of new stuff yeah yes. uh, might, I, might I suggest perhaps i remember sorry i think she said hundreds of items if i my memory serves me might i suggest a layered approach to this uh perhaps we start uh uh kind of circling the perimeter making our way in with the museum perhaps we just have some people unassuming go visit the museum see what sort of cursory things they can notice in the areas where there were suspicious activities. And as we gain more information, we just slowly narrow in deeper until the end when I can hopefully come in and help uh, find information out with my connections. So you've arrived at the library. Fuller, what are you gonna look for first? Well, I'm gonna go for a baseline, really. I wanna know, as much as I'm able to glean off of what kind of God Naboo was. Did he do sacrifices? Was he a good, considered a good God, bad God in the Pathanos? Um, it doesn't take you long to find this. Naboo, the, Assyri the Assyrian and Babylonian God of knowledge and writing was first introduced to Mesopotamia around 2000 BC. Babylon's major deity was Marduk to begin with. Nabu was known as uh, Marduk's scribe, but later assimilated as Marduk's son. In the festival of the new year, a statue of Nabu was taken from the temple of Borsipia to be with his father in the temple of B temples of Babylon. Nabu became one of the major gods in Assyria and was recognized as a god of wisdom writing and scribes as much as the symbols of Naboo included a writing stylus and a claimed clay stone tablet. He was also associated with the tablets of destiny, uh, mythic artifacts that record the fate of humanity. Some myths tell that Naboo recorded the fate of each human life upon a tablet and that he had the power to increase or diminish an individual's fate according to what he wrote. Nabu is portrayed as a noble bearded man wearing a helm or a cap. For some unknown reason, many depictions of Nabu have left their eyes shattered or broken deliberately on purpose. His clasped hands denote that he is a priest. He is sometimes shown mounted on a winged dragon named Sirish, and the name Nabu may be translated into he who is called. <clears throat> interesting. It seems quite interesting, doesn't it? That uh, it talks about being able to elevate man. And it almost appears as though this depiction of Nabu is almost an apotheosis, uh, an elevation of, of a god from a man or a man to a god uh, status. Uh, it's curious. Sounds more like Nabu is is more like position than uh, an actual person. 
like you become the Nabu, kind of like the Buddha. I, I suppose I suppose you could see a parallel in the um, the, the, the corpus somaticum, couldn't you? In in the um, there you go. Yeah, if 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 if, yeah. if Nabu is 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 a scribe like Thoth and and Mercury, um, then then it would seem um, rational to assume that he's 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 in many ways like um, Hermes Trismegistus. Mm. And that he represents yes. something that the that the worshipper, the the priest, is is trying to become. So perhaps this symbolizes the the the, the priest realizing this this divine nature. It would also it, it would also explain the whole situation that uh, the 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 statues, with one statue being more this one statue, this gold statue that we saw being more of an enlightened uh, winged being coming forth from a person and then this description of our friend's statue being more of a twisted thing, kind of like different ideas of of, uh, of, of, of a similar subject there where it's like you have a lighter side where it's more of a enlightenment sort of thing and a darker side which is more of a twisted thing. It's kind just, of it's a parallel strange. between how you could take this 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 knowledge. It's a strange way to depict it, though, because you'd imagine in in worship that the, the the priest would genuflect before the god, rather than and I mean having having the god rising from the back like that. It's almost parasitic. It's ah, you know, but he's it come out the head or the the. The, the heart or something. Right. Nabu means the god that is called, summoned. It also strikes me that um, I, I wonder if any of the resource materials in the library will tell us whether Nabu is normally a winged figure or not a winged figure. That four wings are a peculiar sort of structure that makes me think of a, a dragonfly or something. Uh, yes, but, Thoth, of course, is an ibis, but ibises are not particularly flyers. Hermes has his winged feet and thus has four wings. But I wonder how closely these things parallel. If you look at the Babylonian and Assyrian gods, many of them are depicted with wing, stylized wings, whether they are real wings or not. And we do know that Nabu sometimes rode a dragon. So it seems. Vlad Vladim. Yes. I have a question. You yes. You've certainly been looking at things. Are there any contemporary Iranian or Iraqi uh, cults uh, that are in operation? That I do not know. If you talked about uh, Russia or the, the Slavic end of things, I could probably tell you more about that. But uh, Is anyone aware the, of anything yeah. like that? Well, I know, I know that it's um, it's uh, it's it's uh, still part of the Ottoman Empire, so I'd, I'd assume there must be um, nationalist groups. And what day is it? I seem to have forgotten. Thursday. Um, <laughs> the the day of the year. Uh, is it June ninth? June ninth, Thursday, nineteen twenty-five. There you go. So the, the new year, depending on which calendar is being used, could have some substantial uh, ritual aspect and worship of this, of this divinity or position. I'm curious if what is depicted here is something that happens annually at the New Year's celebration. I don't know if they were following the lunar or solar calendar. And I'm in the volume. I'm not, I'm not sure how much we we do know. I know I know there's a, a great many uh, tablets and things at the museum, but I'm not sure how many of them have been. Um, I believe that the, I believe that the Syrians and Babylonians were sun worshippers. Doesn't mean that's how their calendar worked, though. I, I know we we we, we get the the, the the classical model of the of the seven planets is is uh, is, is theirs, I believe. It's interesting that they knew about all the planets back in the day there. Yes, they had a yes. lot of great knowledge. Oh, but cool. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of that's the, a lot of the Assyrian and, and Babylonian uh, 
anything we have of it is really, you know, up to conjecture and speculation. I mean, we know more about the Egyptian sort of culture and, and, and lifestyle than we do about them at this time. I don't know if there's been much in the way of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, much in the way of translation of, of much of the Assyrian uh, sort of uh, um, uh, remnants, you know, we, other than basic bits and pieces of, of legend and folklore. <clears throat> There is actually uh, quite a bit of it at this point that has been translated. They've got their own version of the Rosetta Stone. Actually, I think the Rosetta Ford, Stone Ford has, knows, has but... a really uniform, doesn't it? Yes, uh -huh, and it's at the British Museum there. Yeah. Uh, question for you, Tom. Uh, would my character have any chance, given his philanthropic uh, information uh, and, and endeavors, to know the address of this individual who was killed? No. Okay. He's, He's just, just a glossop. One, one worker of sure. shop workers that work there. Uh, and Tom, I would like to look at the newspaper accounts of the murder. Of okay. Brayden. I don't actually have a, a handout of that, but suffice it to say, you don't learn anything more than you already know. Okay. We have his address. We know his, he was found by his manservant with his throat cut. Well, and you definitely, some of that is definitely not in the newspaper. So you don't know whether the throat cutting and the done unspeakable acts is just a rumor because the police haven't released that kind of information. Yet. And the police aren't saying theft or not theft? They're, they're saying theft, that it was a, a robbery gone, gone wrong. Fair enough. Or, or a Do they, they have any idea of what... Uh, how much was taken? Uh, You'll have to ask them. <laughs> you know, thinking about it, if it was just a burglary or a housebreak, um, why would the, the, the criminal take time to defile a body and not grab priceless artifacts and make for the door? Well, well, if it was... where, where on earth would they sell them, though? I, I, if it... If, if it was just a common criminal, he would just take anything that looked like it would be worth money to sell. But if they went in with the intent to defile the body for some reason, it's not just a common criminal. Well, in this uh, Carl fellow, I'd be interested in knowing more about him. Uh, if there is uh, some form of cult uh, from that region, it appears as though he may be a key to that situation. From from the the young lady's story, uh, yeah, he does know more than you know. Suspect number one. Something, some sort of link in the chain there, definitely. Intriguing. Uh, I'll say it's probably a, approaching eleven o'clock at night for your characters. Okay. So, gentlemen, we uh, are all agreed that we shall pursue this somewhat no. okay. dark and dubious endeavor. Absolutely. Uh, shall we? Uh, I'm in town. Is everyone else in town? Yeah, yes. Yes, yeah. yes I'm, I'm staying here at the club for a few days. Oh, well, that might be convenient. Yeah. Finishing I have a flat three, we, uh, three streets down. Shall we reflect on these matters uh, before we retire and meet in the morning? I was curious uh, if. Lord Brightman's friend uh, would have access to his home if anybody would like to go take a look at it. Say, um, I'll go, but it's kind of late at night. I mean, Teddy's gone, so I don't know where yeah, we, we can we, expect we, him back or that he we, would have we, access. We could possibly broach the subject, but I'm, um, it's, it's a rather, rather difficult matter going and rooting around a chap's house so soon after he's died. I mean, you know. Yes, even if Bluffstone was still in the building and he's close enough, I'm not sure that we could say a mysterious lady approached us in the upstairs lounge and requested we investigate various murders. All right, then. Yes, where shall we rendezvous here? Shall we um, rendezvous here in the morning? Before you leave, uh, Albright, you had said to learn something about Nineveh. 
Um, all the all that you what the all what you get from that. I, I also didn't make a handout for this, but <clears throat> Nineveh, uh, among among the oldest, largest, and most fabled of ancient cities, was Nineveh, capital of the Assyrian Empire. Settled in 6000 BC, the city lay upon the junction of the Tigris and the Kosa rivers, growing to become a major port centered between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. By 3000 BC, Nineveh had also become an important religious site, with the worshippers of Ishtar, goddess of fertility, love and war, and Nabu, god of writing and wisdom. Over many years, the city prospered, gathered merchants, scholars, and priests into its bosom. Around 700 BC, the, uh, the majesty and importance of Nineveh was at its height, uh, with the city encompassing uh, about seven square kilometers. Uh, bound within its walls were 18 canal systems, temples, centers of commerce, and over 100,000 inhabitants, making it one of the largest cities on earth at the time. All good things must come to an end, and so did Nineveh's end. So did Nineveh end. Following the death of its last great king, Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian Empire unraveled in a series of civil wars. In 616 BC, Assyria was attacked by its former vassals, including the Chaldeans, Babylonians, Persians, and Scythians, leading to the sacking of Nineveh in 612 BC. By 605 BC, the great Assyrian Empire had ceased to be. Its spoils shared between the Medes and the Babylonians and its secrets left to the sands. More modern history, it was completely lost. In fact, people didn't even believe that it really existed. But a it few... Very, very recently, it was... Um trashed by uh, the Islamic State. That's true. Well, I was, I was referring to your, for your game. Uh, oh, recently, right. so, uh, a few decades ago, it was discovered, and there have been expeditions going there trying to find some of the things, like the Temple of Naboo. And the... I, I can tell you that the, the, right at this moment in the British Museum, from the... the um, the clay tablets that were found, um, there, there are still thousands of them that haven't been decoded, haven't been read, because there aren't enough people who read cuneiform. I, I will say this. She said that she's been being followed uh, pretty constantly. Uh, and she came here and spoke to us. So everyone should be on their guard this evening, leaving here. Uh, be aware of everything around you. Uh, you never know what could be skulking in the shadows. I agree, but there are also about 150 plus people walking out of here tonight, so... Unfortunately, we don't know how many people are involved in this either. All right, so are you guys going to retire for the evening? Oh, I'm, I'm going to retire for the evening, but I'm, I'm going to... Um, just before I leave the library, I'd, I'd like to... Um, just try and get some sort of um, a historical overview of um, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> or the, the Assyrian um, culture. Um, just, just something that I can I, sort of skim through. If I okay. Well, I don't, I, I don't have anything prepared like that. However, I do feel that all of you can do all the research you want on the internet after. Games over. <laughs> that's the thing. That, you see, that's that's what I was trying to set up an in-game excuse for for myself. <laughs> like you, you, you've outthought me. It's a really good YouTube video all on the Assyrian Empire. When that's I how leave, I learned how to say Ashurbanipal. <laughs> when I leave, I'm actually going to uh, take a detour instead of going straight to my home. I'm just going to drive past Lord Brightman's house, the shop that was located at, just driving by, uh, looking it out, looking around to see if there's anybody in the area. There's about what you'd expect this time of night, nobody. If I were to park uh, across the road from uh, Brightman's house and wait for a while, would anything happen there? 
I don't know. Is that what you're going to do? Yes. Instead of sleeping? I will sleep soon. I'm too excited to sleep. I would like you... Uh, it, uh, Lord Brightman's house is on the Regent Park Road. Found it. Um, you can see lights on upstairs. Um, in fact, on the very top floor, uh, you can see a, one single light on. Most likely from your experience, this kind of, it's, it's, it's an estate house. Uh, it's probably one of the servants. It's probably also about 11.30, moving towards 12. Uh, do a spot hidden for me. Just 20, a quick... 25 of 25. Um, after a little while, the light turns out and nothing happens. Okay. Just a quick question. Who, per se, is holding on to the golden statue? I, I will. All right. Yeah, I think since Ebenezer was the claimant. All Unless right. Reginald wants it. I'm happy to let Reginald hang on to it if he likes. I know he loves these sorts of things. Um, yeah, I'll take it. Okay. I'll take it when we part. Wrap it back in the red velvet. You're going to be driving around in the dark, uh, <laughs> engaged in a skullduggery. It might be safer if it goes straight home to my safe. Okay. And the very final piece of what I do is just drive by, uh, probably getting close to midnight now, uh, drive by Carl's house, or Carl's shop, and park outside. That's, that's all the way downtown London. Okay. That would be I'll just head home to Whitechapel then. A bit of a drive. drive. Yep. You live right near a ripper house, right? <laughs> I do. I do. Uh, yeah, Whitechapel's not a really nice area, is It's it? not. It's not. So why would you live in Whitechapel? Oh, there are, there, are there. Oh, okay. yeah, there are wealthy um, people who live there. Okay. There are wealthy people who live there. I guess it's got that stereotypic Jack the Ripper. <laughs> members, members of Parliament have to come from wealthy stock anyways, no matter where they are. They represent everywhere. Did you guys uh, fix a time when you would like to get together in the morning and do something? <clears throat> I think 11 in the morning is a uh, civilized time to meet. Mm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so you're going to meet at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning back at the Wentworth Club. Um, but, Reginald, please do a powerful. I'm happy to report both that Reginald is quite powerful and that I rolled a 13 for 80. So I'm well in the extreme zone. Okay. Uh, nothing much happens during the night. However, when you wake up in the morning, you seem to have had a kind of a rough night. You couldn't quite get comfortable laying in your bed. Um, unsettled, but not specific dreams. You don't remember anything. Irritated by small noises. Yeah. Crabby, tired. Quite, quite a story that you heard last night. Yeah. All right, does anybody want to do anything before 11 o'clock? I was going to show up about 10 a.m. and just uh, peruse the newspapers for anything unusual and have coffee and a cigar. Okay. Eat breakfast. Mm, breakfast over uh, perusing my very meager uh, occult library to see if anything pops up that might be of interest. Okay, pretty much nothing happens unusual. Uh, the newspapers just have the, the daily cricket matches. I don't have any idea. <laughs> and, uh, and the club is, of course, you know, you guys can get in there any time. Uh, Angus is already there. Uh, and they do serve breakfast. So I'm going to uh, check my calendars, address book, and staff to see if we know any glossops, because I feel like we must know a glossop, and I would like to get a family connection. Just a hunch. 
All right, do a, a luck roll. Twenty-eight for eighty-seven. I'm a lucky son of a bitch too. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe a second cousin's third, second mm. cousin's uncle. So uh, far enough away to know that they won't know anything and shouldn't be bothered. Right. Fair enough. I bet uh, people get an address. What's that? Maybe I can get an address regarding the condolences or something. I wonder if he was okay. married. Okay. Well, you you uh, you you find out. I don't know. Is he married? I don't believe that he's married. Um. Uh, you do you do run a, you find his address, uh, and uh, if you want to send something to next of kin or something, condolences. Yeah. Okay, black-edged card. That's, that's fine. All right, so you guys all end up back at the Wentworth Club together. What would you like to do? Well, um, just uh, having having read the papers, um, I think I don't, I don't suppose anyone else read about the uh, the, the test match. You do the South Africans; they're doing awfully well. Do you know that you know they brought the, they say they brought the googly back into play? Can you imagine? Mm, don't say. I think we need to round up the lawyer and investigate the house. Good thing. Well, just be be um be discreet, old man. I mean, the chap's just died. I mean, that's that's not we we, we don't want to be seen to be uh, vultures, do we? Uh, Reginald, uh, Cyrus, would you care to accompany me at the British Museum today? I would love to go to the museum. We could certainly use your expertise, Reginald. Uh, yes, it seems like a fruitful avenue of exploration, although given that he was cataloging things that were not yet public, mm. and there's some sort of crime scene, I don't know that we'll have a great deal of access, but we might learn something significant about what is present uh, in, the, in the public collection. Do, do any of you know if the uh, museum has its own library? Because if it does, maybe we could do some research just on uh, the city itself. The, the British oh. Library is one of the largest libraries. Very oh, the, the, well-appointed reading room. Yes. But the museum, the museum has a library or there's right. Right, right in the middle. The oh, right. oh, it does. I thought, I thought so. That's does. why I was asking. Oh, you'll, you'll enjoy it a great deal. It's, it's, it's one of our country's best. We'll have a splendid time there, I'm sure. I, I've actually heard of, heard good things about it, so I'd be looking forward to. I mean, I'm not so much into the books, but I'd still take a look, see if there's anything I can. Be, go be aware, there's, there's only one real rule that they have there, and that's that. Um, you, you can read anything you want, but um, when you're finished, um, you, you have to give it to the librarians to put it back. Don't go and put things back on the shelves yourself. They get terribly upset if you do that. And I learned that the idea. hard way. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, Thank you. Oh, yes, yes. We, 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 I don't want to do that again. Yes, the, the great warding off of, of, of May the 8th, 1919. Yes, but I'll never forget that. <laughs> Mr. Albright, I did want to let you know, last evening I uh, drove by uh, Lord Brightman's house and I noted a light on in the upstairs, probably a servant doing their, tending to their things, but it was quite late at night. So just so you're aware, I do believe there are people at the house still. Good. You might want to be careful uh, going directly from the club to the site of a murder. If somebody is watching, now they no watch watching. you. No. Is that any more dangerous than is that any more dangerous than Reginald holding on to that gold statue? It's a statue. What kind of unless it's, somebody's coming to get gold, it from him? It is a gold statue. Quick appraisal. What what's it worth? Just gold. Just as gold, what's it worth? Oh, just by weight. 
it was what eight inches high, ten inches high. Mm-hmm. Eight inches high. Yeah, and if it's and it's ancient, it's it's terribly valuable. Yeah, no one's going to care. It's to say. That it's ancient. If someone's going to steal it, they're stealing it for the gold content, most likely. Or the uh, uh, value of it. I I will remind you that nobody on the planet knows that he has it except that you guys. Well, mm-hmm. yes, I know that. Um, but we don't know about the killer now, do we? The killer doesn't know that he's got it. How could he possibly? It, unless it's Teddy or Nevi, they have no idea. Uh, well, even, I think we're all gentlemen. And even Nevi doesn't know which one of you has it. Quite. And although it is one of my concerns that uh, uh, Pierre was murdered in his own home, my home is not quite that elaborate or secure. Well, Mr. Harcourt, if you'd like to stay somewhere, you're free to stay with myself. It's a lonely, large building. Oh, no, thank you. I'm very comfortable in my own home. I just don't know why uh, our, our departed uh, clubmate wasn't safe in his own. Anyway, not even the staff knows where my safe is. Very good. Gold is trading for twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents an ounce U.S. right now. I, I saw that in the newspaper this morning. I don't know what it. What's that in real money? Not quite sure, <laughs> sir. Quite a bit. It's about five times the rate of the U.S. dollar. It is. The U.S. dollar is quite weak. I'm not sure how many ounces the statue would be. Well, not to mention that uh, the antiquity aspect of the. Uh, well, that that makes it pricey. Quite a bit. Yeah. Antiqu- antiquities are quite uh, well sought after these days. Well, Mr. Gamantov and uh, Mr. Fitzroy, what will you be, guys be doing? Will you be accompanying Mr. Albright? Well, I, 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 I suppose so. Um, I, I, I think we, we, we could possibly um, inveigle ourselves in, 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 into the, the, the place in question, but I'm, I'm Awfully worried that uh, the servants might call the uh, um, the, the rosers, as, 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 as they say in the paper. Perhaps. Well, just a thought. Maybe if we all uh, mosey on over to the museum, a couple of us could take a quick walk around the facilities, and some of the other fellows can. Uh... There's no quick walk around those facilities, Mr. Finley. I've never been there, but the others can uh, research in the library. Well, if, if, if some of you chaps are, are going to the library, I, I'm sure it might be uh, worth a while if, if one or two of us went off and had a chat with the, uh, the curators in the, in, the, in the relevant department. If they're um, amenable to discussion, I think so. I do think that at least... I think that no one should visit this uh, sweet relics uh, as an individual. I think at least two yeah. persons should go. Well, I'm just thinking that somebody from the library that might be given a tour or somebody knowledgeable might have studied up, but I've actually been to Africa and Egypt. Maybe I can use some of my exploring tales to, to charm them and to uh, show me some, uh, some items. Um, you, you can certainly um, try. Well, again, I, I do have connections there, so if you'd like me to speak to some people, I'm, I'm more than happy to if you want to play that card. It's so, amazing uh, what it can do in an establishment like that. I don't know of an, an establishment of a different nature. Hmm. Um, is anyone does anyone feel strongly about the sweet relics emporium of Mr. Carl Schweinselber? Schweinsalker. I'm leery to approach that this soon, Mr. Harcourt. Well, I mean, I don't uh, intend to uh, mention any artifacts or individuals by name. I mean to get a sense of the place. I but I do think that you should not go alone to a place yes. in which an apparent criminal is active. I might be able to help out there since uh, my family's been involved in import-export. I might be able to, how you say, get the foot in the door. 
No, you know, I think, uh, uh, Vadim, that makes a good deal of sense. Uh, a couple of uh, international, let's say, Europeans might be able to communicate, and I can merely observe. So I'm happy to, uh, to accompany you there rather than going to the museum. Very well. So sure. then it's Mr. Harcourt and Mr. Gavantov is heading to Carl's establishment. Mr. Albright is heading to Lord Brightman's house. And Cyrus, myself, and Mr. Fitzroy will head to the British Museum. Is that right? Yes, yeah, jolly good. I think that's the plan, gentlemen. Do take care, Mr. Albright. I hope we should all take some care. Yes. yes well, he's going alone. Concerns me. Ah, uh, I'm okay. All right, let's see. However, I do suggest we stash the statue. Oh, you can trust Mr. Harcourt. He'll take good care of it. Talking about you know, I'm going to take good care of it, but a scamp would kill you for a guinea down in Whitechapel. No, I do agree. Maybe putting it into a bank vault might not be such a bad idea. Uh, actually, well, I, 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 have a, I have a safe deposit at the, the Chancery Lane safe deposit. Uh, Mr. Harcourt. Your offer, uh, but I've actually left it in my safe at home. How many priceless oh, objects have you had in your possession, Mr. Harcourt? Uh, I, I've had a, a thing or two. I, I trust your safety and security. I appreciate it. So I was going to see uh, Lord Brightman's house. I am. Okay. Alone? Yep. Alone. Okay. <coughs> I want to do that one first. So um, you drive down uh, Regent Park Road uh, until you get to Lord Brightman's house where he lives. And uh, you're in the front. It's a nice estate. Uh, what would you like to do? Pull up. Go knock on the door. Okay. In introduce myself. You knock on the door, and the door is answered. Uh, yes, sir. I introduce myself. And, um... Well, introduce yourself. Don't tell me that you're going to introduce yourself. He goes, good evening, my friend. My name is Fuller Albright. I am a friend of the recently passed. And um, I wish to pay my respects and um, speak with his lawyer. Mm, I'm sorry, his lawyer is not here. Would you by chance know his lawyer's name? Uh, I do not, Mr. Uh, sir. Uh, that is uh, being handled by... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know you. You say you're a friend of Lord Brightman, but uh, yes. I've never seen you before. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm a friend from afar. I've not been in this town before. Well, I, I can appreciate that, but uh, I, I don't... Uh, there, there's been a crime here. I'm not exactly sure what it is you're hoping to gain. Well, gain nothing? I merely wanted to know the facts. I'm sorry. Uh, who did you say that you were? My name is Fuller Albright. A friend of Lord Brightman's. Well, as you know, he's been murdered. Uh, what more is there to say? my line of work we often run into people who wish us harm and um, let's just say that um, I would like to speak to his lawyer in regards to the intricacies of the case and see um. if we might perhaps have any clue as to what um and what is your what is your line of work sir i am an antiquarian i collect books 
I'm sorry, sir. I don't see any relevance between that and Mr. Uh, Lord Albright's uh, lawyer or your need to know uh, private things about him. Uh, perhaps you can uh, inquire at his club. Do you not at least know the name of the lawyer? I'm sorry, sir. Good day. And he uh, closes the door. I don't have anything that I can push with it. So, I mean, you know, I don't have any persuade or anything like that. So there's nothing I can do. So I guess I go back to the club. Okay. So you're heading back to the club. Let's do, uh, let's do Carl, uh, <laughs> that name. Uh, let's see. Schweinsalber? Yeah, Schweinsalber, I think. How German does it look? Uh, Schweinsalber. Schweinsalber. That's a dirty joke, I think. Um, anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, let's do that one. Let's do it. Actually, actually, I think I'm going to call it there because the two next parts have a lot to them. So if you go quite a bit over. All right. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Okay. All right. Let me find my thing. <laughs> Our players included Jason Melnichot, Tim Hart, Mick Swan, Ford Fitch, Jerry Bryant, and David Gassaway with yours truly as the Keeper of the Secrets. We're currently producing up to four sh five shows a week with music and sound effects added in post-production in order to create a richer listener experience. We provide audio-only versions of our shows free for you to download from Podbean or iTunes. The costs involved with the shows are provided almost entirely by our patrons. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. If you'd like to support us, uh, visit our patreon account just a dollar to a month helps us a lot you can find a link in our description below like share and subscribe to our channel and punch that bell icon for updates on our latest shows and leave us some comments we enjoy reading them and answering any questions you might have this is tom Rayleigh, together with all the members of our gaming club inviting you to journey with us once again into the darkness for another adventure into the universe of hp lovecraft and the call of cthulhu role-playing game until next time good luck and good gaming